The following program is being brought to you on the 7th Wave Network. For more information about our network and to check our additional show hosts and topics of interest, please visit 7thWaveNetwork.com. The Voice America Talk Radio Network is the worldwide leader in live Internet talk radio. Visit VoiceAmerica.com. The views and ideas expressed on the following program are strictly those of the host or guests and do not necessarily reflect the views and ideas held by the Voice America Talk Radio Network, its staff, and management. Welcome. You've entered the realm of 1111 Talk Radio. Your host is Simran Singh. It's time to discover your own language with the universe. Learn to empower yourself, broaden your mind, open your heart, and discover who you are. Now, here's your host, Simran Singh. For more than 20 years, Gloria Karpinski has taught all over North America and internationally. She conducts seminars and gives lectures for diverse groups and really brings a realness to spirituality and personal growth and development. She is the author of Where Two Worlds Touch and Barefoot on Holy Ground and has also recently released the CD version of Where Two Worlds Touch. And I would like to welcome Gloria Karpinski to 1111 Talk Radio. Well, thank you so much, Lenny. I'm delighted to be with you. You know, I was thrilled to have you on, Gloria, because I think you bring such a real grounded voice to so many of the concepts and topics that more and more individuals are awakening to. And as more fear comes uh, is, is coming about with so much of what's going on in the world, I think people are gravitating to understand their spirituality and the differences between what spirituality and religion are, and, and you really bring some some realness and, and definition to that. Well, thank you so much. That um, that's very affirming. That is uh, really part of my intention is um, is for that discovery that we are indeed first and foremost spiritual beings. We are um, in in a physical body in this time frame. And uh, with the opportunity and the privilege, as well as the pressures that go, with manifesting uh, what we know spiritually and awakening to that and giving it arms and legs, so to speak. Well, and as we go through the world and we're being that human aspect of ourselves, but yet we're wanting to grasp out and reach into who we really are, which is the spirituality of ourselves, there tends to be resistance for many in the beginning, um, just due to a lot of change and, and things like that. How do people work through that resistance and change that kind of sometimes is in your face? Well, you know, I don't think there is an easy answer to that. What I would say is that we're living in a time that does have the benefit of uh, many sciences coming together, and that includes a lot of the sciences of psychology. Um, and methods that have come uh, from different traditions, different kind of symbolisms, trainings, psycho-spiritual development processes from all over the world that uh, thanks to education and thanks to the Internet and um, perhaps baseline thanks to evolution, we are in a cycle now where all that is available to us. And, and I think the good news is it's available to us. The challenging news is the danger of overwhelm. Uh, which I think is very real for people. Most definitely. And, and as we're shifting planetary as, as well as just our own daily human shifts that we go through, it, it feels like things are just going faster and faster. And how, do you, how does one support themselves in this fast pace of, of keeping up with what's going on in the world but yet trying to understand what it means to be still? Well... You know, that's what all the sciences are about, aren't they? Uh, whether it's the science of meditation, whether it is art, what comes from the therapeutic areas of life and disciplines. Uh, and that is uh, to, first of all, have, a, have the longing to do so. I mean, if one is just caught in all of that frenzy, uh, then one can quickly lose uh, any sense of being grounded or balanced. So the first thing is to really have the longing. And there's a law of energy, seriously, that is no more romantic than gravity. 
that says or uh, whatever you hold in your mind, in your consciousness, we could say, in your desire pattern, is going to act like a magnet. And out of thousands, even millions of possibilities, it will attract to you people and books and concepts and opportunities. So I think that, you know, when you start uh, waking up or, or refine the waking up or, or realize, hey, wait a minute, this whole world is really on high speed uh, and I want to find my balance, I think you have to even borrow a little bit of the knowledge from other people until such time as you know, as you remember it yourself. And I say remember because I honestly think that's what happens as we wake up, is that it's not so foreign as it seems to be at first. But as we wake up, it's like, I know that. You know, that feels right. And you'll hear that so often. And it's okay to... to to borrow from other people or to hear other concepts. It's not like we're betraying anything because in the end we can always go back and choose where it is we really want to be or remember, as you were saying. Well, I think this is really true because we borrow knowledge all the time. I don't have the knowledge when I get on an airplane, but I'm trusting the science of that aeronautics. (laughs) You know, and when we start learning biology when we're little kids and stuff, we don't know it yet, but we, we trust that there has been a body of evidence and a body of knowledge that we can take our steps on, you know, and then grow into our own knowing, and that's where I think the knowing becomes remembering. Well, you know, I've always been a universalist, and I can find the beauty in so many different traditions, and I can also find the beauty in worshiping many different uh, or, or re- revering many different uh, individuals that have come onto the planet and brought such light. And sometimes I find that others have a challenge to that. They, they do feel that there is a bit of a betrayal or that there is, it's better to stay focused on one path. And is there really a right or a wrong way to do this? I don't know that I can answer that in all honesty. I mean, what I would, would say is uh, to respect the fact that um, you've been inhaling your culture from the day you were born uh, with every magazine, with every newscast or, or every television program, with every comment you've heard, with all the body language you've observed, for every ritual you've been in. And if that's been in an enclosed system, uh, then, of course, your ego self or personality self, I don't mean vanity, I just mean the sense of self, of, of of individual personality is going to react and say, what are you doing? What are you doing? Uh, but, but I think that passes as one um, declares an intention to know the truth. I do think it's important to be discerning, but that's very different than being fearful. Uh, you know, it's like trusting your own path, trusting your own, um, what I would call the inner light, um, that longing in itself begins to be your first guarantee. But I want the truth. I mean, you can say from the beginning, what I want is the truth for me. Uh, the truth I get at a certain stage is, is not as unfolded as it may be as I have confidence. Do you, do you understand? Mm-hmm. I remember saying that in such a way it makes any sense. Well, I think for the listeners, too, uh, to go back with what you just said at one particular point was to be discerning um, and not fearful. Because I think sometimes those two get intertwined for people. It, sometimes uh, it's not discernment, it's fear. And other times it's not fear, it truly is discernment. Mm-hmm. So how does one find that place? Well, I think it's, it, it all comes down, doesn't it, to know thyself. That was what was written over the Delphic Oracle. And it continues to be the first mandate, is to know thyself. And I think by whatever means, this is, you know, um, Start, starting with a commitment to honesty. And honesty doesn't mean I'm just going to reinforce my prejudices, you see, or reinforce what those around me have necessarily said. You know, you may end up agreeing with them. You may end up embracing the very rituals and very, the very belief system and so forth that you did grow up with or, that, or was the, uh, the limits that you had when you started. You know, but trusting yourself and uh, making a commitment to honesty and getting to know yourself and through whatever, using whatever tools work for you. Um, you know, I'm, 
great believer in therapies of various kinds, body therapies and psychotherapies and spiritual direction, because I think they hold up mirrors for us. I think they ask, ask the difficult questions. And then I think you start looking around for the tools that work for you, um, not necessarily the tools that work for your neighbor or even the people you're in the same group with, but what is it that fits you, you know, at a given point? Right, right. And spirituality is not always going to be what everyone else is doing. It really it is a very, very individual path. But then it's one that we lead back to oneness with all others. Exactly. You know, um, my um, my own path has used a lot of clairvoyance, uh, and all that really essentially means in the sense that I'm using it is it translates a lot of right brain um, information into um, images and symbols. And I have uh, very often seen various pathways that lead to one big road. I almost think of it kind of like individual roads that lead to a super highway. And no matter what road you take, it is a legitimate one. Do you understand what I mean when I say that? Um, all of them are to be respected, and all of them are, we could say in another way of framing it, they're all containers that contain uh, truths. And those, those, those truths are often symbolized by a cultural imprint so that if I'm raised in a certain country with a certain uh, rhythm to that culture and a certain uh, set of symbols, then the way that truth is interpreted is going to symbolically be different, even though the bottom line may be the same. For example, I, I've studied many, many religions and respect them all, truly. I'm like you. I'm very much of a universe. And I've never found one that the bottom line truly isn't love. And, and, and not sentimental love I'm talking about. I'm talking about that unconditional love. It's the love that we would say of the Buddha, the love of the Christ, uh, the love of bodhisattvas, uh, the love of saints, <laughs> the love of good people. Well, and that's what I have found, too, that if, if rather than looking so much at the, the rituals or the, uh, the outer clothing of some religions, if we got to what the truths were and found where they align with every other truth, that's really where the pearls of wisdom are. It's, it's the truths within each thing because some of it has come that is man-made. Some of it has been political. Some of it, all religions have those aspects in them, and we have to discern what it is that really resonates with us. I think that's absolutely true, and and I think the more that we become educated, and 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 what I mean by that is is opening our mind to uh, consider the teachings that come from other places, and also look at their clothing, and respect it, but say what is the essence here, you know, underneath the symbolism and underneath the codes and the the uh, cultural uh, packaging. What is the truth? And we, we come down to interconnectedness. And I am here with Gloria Karpinski, who is the author of Where Two Worlds Touch, Spiritual Rites of Passage and Barefoot on Holy Ground. In 1988, Gloria received a gift from the Lawrence S. Rockefeller Fund for the Enhancement of the Human Spirit. Join me in just a few minutes, and we'll speak a little bit more to Gloria about the seven steps of conscious change. Your online community for positive change. Seventh Wave Network. We all want peace. We all desire a more meaningful life. We work hard to achieve these things, but at what avail? The key is authentic living with Andrea Matthews. Andrea will interview some of the great spiritual experts of today and will provide wisdom to help you raise your consciousness to the level of your own I am. Your authenticity can give you miraculous gifts, but you have to know how to get there. Listen for Authentic Living with Andrea Matthews. Heard live every Wednesday afternoon at 4 p.m. Eastern Time, 1 p.m. Pacific Time on the 7th Wave Network. Have you seen 1111? Do you wonder why certain numbers keep showing up in your life? 11, 111, 22, 33, 444... 
People all over the world are seeing 1111 and learning the language of universal communication. Subscribe to 1111 Magazine today, www.1111mag.com. 1111 Magazine is a bi-monthly print publication that offers a rich, multi-sensory experience. As you engage with experts and topics of consciousness, become enlightened, empowered, and energized so you live a passionate and authentic life of conscious choices. 1111 Magazine, a daily staple for lifting the mindset, discovering the heart, and stepping into conscious living. 1111 Magazine. Order now at www.1111mag.com. 1111mag.com. Mom? Dad? How long should I wait for you? Mom? If I'm at soccer practice. What if something happens? Will you come get me? There's no reason not to have a plan in case of a terrorist attack. Mom, if you're not home, should we go to the neighbor's house? And some extremely good reasons why you should. Can you tell me? Everybody should have a plan. Take five minutes to talk about where you'll meet and how you'll get in touch with each other in an emergency. For other things you can do to be prepared, visit www.ready.gov. A public service announcement brought to you by the U.S. Department of Homeland Security and the Ad Council. The new home for visionary positive change. Seventh Wave Network. are listening to 1111 Talk Radio. If you'd like to join today's discussion, please call in toll-free at 1-866-472-5795. Again, 1-866-472-5795. You may also send an email to info at believesc.com. Now back to 1111 Talk Radio with Simran Singh. Gloria Karpinski is a holistic counselor, spiritual director, teacher, and author. Her seminars, as well as her individual in-depth life attunements, emphasize the relevancy of universal spiritual principles to everyday life and the interdynamics of mind, body, emotions, and spirit. You can find many of her pieces, such as her books, Barefoot on Holy Ground and Where Two Worlds Touch, along with her new audio book and other meditation CDs, on her website at GloriaKarpinski.com. Gloria, we were speaking about some of the changes that are going on and the difference between discernment and fear. And what I find is with so much of the discussion starting around 2012, which for people in this arena that have been reading, 2012 is not anything new, but it is starting to become a concept talked about a little more among the masses. And for some people it sends them into fear, what is the nature of the changes that are going on as we move forward? Well, um, well, <laughs> I wouldn't presume to say that I can name all the changes by any means. Um, what I would say is, um, I preface what I'm going to say by saying that, that when my work started in the 70s, uh, my own spiritual guidance um, referred to 2012. At that time, I never even heard any reference to 2012. This is before all the material came out about the Mayan calendar and all that. And the reason I say that is because at a very deep level, I trust it because it was there before I was quoting a lot of other people and a lot of other things. So I really kind of trust that it was a heads up, so to speak, spiritually speaking. Uh, and as I've gone along uh, with counseling and teaching and working with virtually hundreds of people, uh, I've become aware of how many people in how many disciplines are uh, sensitive to that. And now, as you're saying, that which has been a sort of esoteric and started to, to come in like a distant sound is now being heard like a great roar everywhere. And I think people, um, people sense this even when they don't have the the number to put to it. I don't think, let me say this, I don't think that, that the flower is going to fall off into the sea and that we're going to explode or the poles are going to turn upside down uh, or all the other things that, uh, that become the more extreme expressions of people's uh, fears. What I do feel is that we're in a shift. In, in my language, I would say it's an evolutionary shift. And I think, you know, if you're a scientist or that's a social scientist too, you might, you might be inclined to speak of quantum leaps and paradigm shifts. Uh, you know, if you're a fundamentalist, you may be saying Jesus is coming. 
it, it, and, and if you were a Muslim, you might be saying the Mahdi's coming. Or if you're an astrologer, you might be saying it's Pisces moving into Aquarius. Um, it's really an almost 26,000-year cycle change. And so I don't think any of us have any recorded history whatsoever on how to know what, what all can happen. What we do know is things are not the same and the very ground is shaking under our feet. And our systems are all being challenged. And uh, the good news is, is that that which no longer works is going to be in our face so that we can change it. But we have to be real with each other. It's also very painful. And, and it's therefore imperative that we find our spiritual tools to stand steady and we unload what we don't need anymore. And, and you speak a lot about cycles and rhythms. Yes. And sometimes those cycles and rhythms, do they come forward for a purging of sorts, for a, a, a new phoenix rising experience, whether it is spiritual or physical or in any of Very the realms? Interesting. Yeah, interesting way to put that. Uh, yeah, my experience has been that, um, that life cycles, and I see this in nature, which is the, um, at the physical level, certainly one of our ways to, um, to check out reality. I see it in, in in counseling with people. I can almost guarantee you the first time someone sees me, they're either 21, 28, 35, 42, 49, 56. Uh, and that's because when we are at those turnings, we start seeking. You know, something I, you know, the image that I feel with that is, is that something unfolds, like a time-release capsule kind of goes off inside of our spirit and says, okay, now we're going to look at this. In some languaging, we would say it's another piece of karma that gets unfolded to deal with. Um, and, and karma not meaning good or bad, no judgment to it, just meaning the things that from a soul level we chose to work on or contribute to, or take our place in the dharma or the flow of things. Um, and I think they do come in, in cycles. And I think, you know, the law of energy says... Um, you know, that as above, so below, and as within, so without. I mean, that's a, that's a principle that shows up in just about every training. And so I think our society does in macrocosm what we do in microcosm, which is move in cycles, you know. Absolutely, and it's very interesting how you bring up specific ages where, where events happen or we, or we go through a cycle, and... The spirituality process, you, you speak about seven steps of conscious change, and you spoke earlier about know thyself. So for someone to move forward and really start to know thy, know themselves and work through this period that's coming that is known and yet unknown, to take those seven steps of conscious change, how do they... How did I learn to trust? How did you get to the place where you could trust all these different parts of yourself? Well, the oldest thing we say to each other, and it's absolutely the truth, which is that it is a process. I think the first thing I want to say to anybody is be gentle and loving with yourself. You are already unfolding if you're even asking the question. So, so that's the first piece of trust is what is this, what is this inside of me that's asking the question? You see, I started asking when I was a child, and, uh, and, and you know, I, I fell in love with Jesus when I was little, but I also started challenging some of the things that were taught to me, not in my family so much, but what I heard around me, and the exclusivity factor was always troublesome to me. It didn't feel like it was compatible with that which my uh, child self knew, you know, so, uh, or experienced, I should say. And then as I went through my process, um, I, you know, I had to pass through absolutely all the, all the questions that we all do, uh, which is the fear that you're doing something terribly wrong to even explore somewhere else. You've got to understand that I came from a reasonably small um, southern city, and it was a long time ago. Uh, but here's, here again, I can testify that the principle always works. The time I got to college, I was exploring everything, and I tried, you know, for a while I thought I was a Buddhist, and then I thought I was this, and I thought I was that, and I tried on every hat possible, and I'd bless every one of them because they all taught me something. 
And then at what? As I went along, I finally, you know, I went into therapy, which I absolutely bless. I think a lot of our therapists today are our priests and priestesses because they help facilitate that know thyself. And um, and then and then I finally did the one thing that all traditions say, which is meditate. Mm. Learn to be still, to be quiet, to go within. So I think it is a process. Um, you know, and every um, every day, every year of my life, I try to embrace the experiences that come to me uh, and, and pay attention. You, you acquire tools gradually, you know, and some troop tools, they really work for a cycle of time, and then you don't need them anymore. You know, the Hindus have a wonderful expression for that. They say that you, that you um, build a raft across the river, but you don't strap it to your back to go up the mountain. <laughs> You know, and and I found that to be true. You know, most definitely. Know. And it, it seems like meditation or stillness or whatever someone wants to call it, that really is the only true way to hear that inner voice. That that has to be one of the steps at some point awesome. that an individual is willing to go into. I think so, and I and I and I think that that, that part of the uh, if someone doesn't meditate, part, part of what they have to retire is uh, any hocus-pocus around it or any sort of imagination that's going to be the hardest thing they ever tried to do or it's complex or they, they've got to know a lot of it. No, you're probably meditating when you've gone into a zone of any kind. You, do you know? Um, I mean, that, that place where you're feeling your connection with life and nature and your breath and, and you feel that moment of peace. Maybe it's just a moment. You feel your connection with your own life and your own soul. What you do is build on that. You find the, the method that, that all is relevant to you, that, that feels that you can be in sync with, you know. And so often to get to that place of meditation requires us getting to a place of surrendering to it, to say, okay, I'm finally going to do this. Surrender seems to be a big part of the spiritual growth process, and it seems to be a place that one, at least I have gotten to over and over and over again. Mm-hmm. How do well, you... I th- I th- you know, I think so, but uh, can I just interrupt you to say sure. that I, I think su- su- surrender can also be a scary word to people. I think if they, if they would look at this as surrender is letting go of the illusions gradually about what you are not. It is not that you're going to discover something that you're not right now. It's just that we've bought into so many lies and so many distortions and so many illusions and so many programmings from other people and, and, and systems uh, that, w- that what our work is is to dismantle all those distortions uh, and all those uh, misperceptions. And so that's, you know, that is a process. And that letting go is, um, and, and one actually experiences that, even physiologically. And one experiences a resistance when the personality says, is afraid, you know, gets frightened. So, am I making some sense with that? <laughs> Absolutely. And actually in, in your book, which is also now on a CD audio version, uh, Where Two Worlds Touch, you talk about the seven steps of conscious change and some of your steps happen to be challenge and then resistance. When we come back, we're going to speak a little bit more to Gloria Karpinski about the awakening, the commitment, and the purification that goes along with that whole step towards conscious change. Gloria Karpinski can be reached at GloriaKarpinski.com, where you can find her books, her CDs, and now ongoing meditations to help you unfold in your process. She received the gift of the Lord's S. Rockefeller Fund for the enhancement of the human spirit and does ongoing classes, workshops, and private consultations, both nationally and abroad. We'll be right back with Gloria Karpinski. Be Extraordinary. Seventh Wave Network. Have you seen 1111? Do you wonder why certain numbers keep showing up in your life? 11, 111, 22, 33, 444. People all over the world are seeing 1111 and learning the language of universal communication. Subscribe to 1111 Magazine today. www.1111mag.com 
1111 Magazine is a bi-monthly print publication that offers a rich, multi-sensory experience. As you engage with experts and topics of consciousness, become enlightened, empowered, and energized so you live a passionate and authentic life of conscious choices. 1111 Magazine, a daily staple for lifting the mindset, discovering the heart, and stepping into conscious living. 1111 Magazine. Order now at www.1111mag.com. 1111mag.com. Are you looking for Life's Balance? Look no further than 7th Wave Network. We're bringing you Life's Balance with Shaman M. Let Melody McBride take you on a unique listening experience. You'll explore the world of alternative health. Learn about the many facets of healing. Preventative lifestyles from children to seniors will be discussed on the show. Listen for Life's Balance with Shaman M. Broadcast live every Monday at 11 a.m. Pacific Time and 2 p.m. Eastern Time on 7th Wave Network. It's the healthy side of life. Let peace and balance be yours. And the results indicate your child has neuroblastoma. There's evidence of metastasis. We need to schedule a bone we'll need to perform a surgical biopsy. Biopsy. MIBG scan. After you hear your child has cancer, chances are you don't hear anything else. CureSearch.org connects you to the most comprehensive research and advice on childhood cancer and to other families who know exactly what you're going through. CureSearch.org. You're not as alone as you feel. Brought to you by CureSearch and the Ad Council. Listening on a higher dimension. Seventh Wave Network. You are listening to 1111 Talk Radio. If you'd like to join today's discussion, please call in toll free at 1 866 472 5795. Again, 1 866 472 5795. You may also send an email to info at believesc.com. Now back to 1111 Talk Radio with Simran Singh. Gloria Karpinski writes about change, writes about movement, writes about spirituality. She brings the realness to spirituality that sometimes uh, so many others place up in the air, and she's able to support individuals in really taking a step-by-step process through her books and her audio CDs. Gloria, there are so many topics we could go into, and I know that I want to bring forward some of the things that people are really dealing with now so that they can understand how to support themselves. Um, There's a lot of stress that people are experiencing with the economy, um, with different changes in the world, with so much that's going on with how to raise our children in today's times. And that stress, I mean, perhaps that's underladen with fear. Perhaps it is uh, just all of us being too busy. Mm -hmm. What do you think about all of that? Oh, well, (laughs) Well, I would say um, this. Um, The world is in rapid change, and I think we would be very naive to say we're going to stop that. I think that everything is accelerated, and um, therefore we have to make a choice. That is part of exercising our divine birthright is the ability to choose, is that what I will do with with my time, not only my obvious time, but my inner time, and... Uh, what I will hold on to and, and what I will choose to let go of and what thought form, what thoughts I want to energize. Um, and so at some point we have to face the fact that we have the divine right to choose. I will energize this fear or I will observe this fear. I will observe that everything around me is changing, that the economy is going upside down, that the earth under me is changing, that, that you, you know, country, everything from uh, international boundaries to all the planetary concerns that have to do with global warming, that have to do with all the whole ecological scene, that have to do with people moving back and forth like Im- immigrants, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. There, it, it's all in change. So, you know, I personally think that, that, that as soon as one takes a deep breath and says, you know what, from a soul level, however I frame it, whether I say, you know, God sent me here as if this were outside of me, or I say, I made the choice to be here. Here I am. So now I get to choose. How do I want to stand in this? 
And if I say, I want to find peace in it, I can. I want to find poise in the middle of this chaos, I can. But I'm going to have to commit to it. I'm going to have to work at it, you know. And the thing is that law of attraction is going to work. I'm going to pull to me everything I need to support that quest. One of the things I do want to say about fear is just when, when, when any of us are considering it, and I do, and I try to notice all the time if something is um, wanting me to fear, you know, if something is, is stimulating me to go into fear. And I've been trained in spirit that fear is an energy of constriction. And anytime there's constriction, whether it's a blood vessel or we're talking about trying to let our spirit breathe through us, uh, it, things get tight. And, and you couldn't see the, most of us couldn't see the truth that was right in front of us, or we couldn't feel peace if it were, you know, flooding us when we're in a state of fear. So uh, I went in prayer and meditation and asked for a, a simple way to think about this at a moment's notice so that I didn't have to go through a great theological confrontation with myself <laughs> uh, if I ever feel fear or I'm talking to someone about fear. And here's what came back is that fear, any kind of fear, is a symptom of the illusion of separation. What that really means is whether, no matter what I'm afraid of, I have at that moment imagined that the divine is, or, or, or spiritual essence is not present there. God, I would say, is not present in that moment. And that's what fear says. And that is an illusion. And most of us would say, that's really silly. We know God is everywhere. So if we take a deep breath and say, right, I may not like what's happening. I may not even, you know, I may not understand it at all. But I will affirm, with this power to choose, I will affirm that God is present in this situation, whether it's a family troublesome problem or it's money or a job loss or a health challenge or anything, that, whether, that one day I'll understand it, but right now I might not. So the tincture for this is love. The tincture for this illusion is love. And that's an easy, that's an easy equation to get on paper. And then... If you accept it, it becomes very uh, practical. It really becomes very practical. You don't have to go through a lot of contemplation about it. It's just, okay, I'm afraid at this moment then I have the illusion that God isn't present. What's the answer to this? Move into my heart center and remind myself that God is love. Well, and that's keep... so powerful because uh, when we do go into that place of fear, it does feel like a separation. Yes, exactly. And, 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 and are, are the other negative emotions also just varying pieces of how disconnected we're feeling for us to remember our connectedness? I think you're probably, you're probably right about that. I think the first thing, when, if we want to have connection with each other, the first thing we have to do is work, is work at getting our parts connected. You know, one of the biggest illusions we got going ever is that we can separate mind, body, spirit. It's impossible. And I'm happy uh, to see that our um, physical sciences are more and more acknowledging that. I mean, you know, it was just yesterday that we actually thought that emotions and mind didn't really have a whole lot to do with the body. I mean, right. that was not, we weren't even teaching that. And now that is course standard teaching is to, is to know the chemistry of emotions. The chemistry of thinking patterns, belief systems, you know, there, there's no way to separate them. So I think a lot of our, um, our, our process is to find out where am I disconnected, but my emotions to my body or my mind to my emotions and all of it to my spirit. And the more I find, you know, I distill out of all the smorgasbord of techniques around, I distill the ones that work for me. Maybe they're just one or two. You don't have to have 20. In fact, that can be overwhelming. You know, it's like picking just a handful of techniques, a breathing thing, a body discipline, some, you know, adjustment in the diet, some uh, mental affirmation, you know, whatever, um, and, then, and then feed that. And I have found that if individuals will take a very well-rounded approach to their wholeness and understand that they need to feed and nurture themselves in several different ways, yes. that they begin to know themselves better as well. Yes. And that it's okay to, to participate in your own life. I think a lot of people feel like they need the permission to participate in their own lives. 
That's interesting. What, what, what exactly do you mean by that? Well, I, I feel like perhaps a lot of this change that is going on right now is so that individuals engage more. So many people out there have become those hamsters on the wheel, have uh, kind of numbed out and become deadened to so much Mm -hmm. that's going on. I mean, if you look at some of the horror movies that are out there, they just keep getting worse and worse and worse, and it's like we numb out to the degree that we allow ourselves to see. And there's some lines that are in your book, Where Two Worlds Touch, that has always really resonated with me and I have found so powerful, and I'd like to read those just now. Sure. Change challenges, relieves, frustrates, threatens, saddens, or exhilarates us. Mainly it forces us to grow. It is the mechanism through which the nature ensures evolution and the way God calls us home. It scares away our illusions about ourselves and others. Change invites us to stretch and risk. It offers new births in consciousness to the degree that we are willing to die to the old. And perhaps all of this that is happening right now, all of this change that is bringing up within us this fear, this stress, is because there's a time now to stretch, to to grow, to, to grow in a way, a faster way than perhaps we've ever allowed ourselves, with a deeper commitment than we've ever allowed ourselves to have. I, th- I think so. And as we're stretching to claim new things, we have to let the old, a lot of the old things go. And and I think that's that is a very personal process, you know, is, 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 of knowing yourself and finding out what is standing in the place that divides myself, you, you know, divides me into parts, <laughs> so that I have a, a deep. Uh, what I'm seeking is to have this uh, alignment between my spirit and my mind and my emotions and my body. And we all know what that feels like at a given moment. You know, just about everybody's had a moment like that. And sometimes a life like that, I suppose. This is why we look at uh, our heroes and heroines in, in spiritual development and with such awe. It's because we all know that to uh, take on these illusions, um, it, takes a, uh, it takes a lot of commitment and, uh, and a lot of willingness to die. I mean, there's not a tradition... I have studied that doesn't talk about the death that happens, and that's part of the purification. It is a death that frees us to be who we really are. It frees us to have peace. It frees us to, 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 to tap our creativity, which is really the working energy of our inner spirit. But the process itself isn't always fun, and so now we're not going through it just individually. We're going through it collectively. And is that part of what Jesus was trying to show us, that that in, in dying and in being crucified, that there is a rebirth that can happen, there is a resurrection that can happen, and that, that is something that we experience throughout our lives? Is that some of the symbology that's going on there? Well, yeah, I would think so, and that opens the door to, to a very complex subject. I wouldn't want to take that too much out of context for fear of, uh, you know, of being misleading by being too much of a shorthand. What I would say is just to refer back to something you said earlier. It's like um, if you go to Greek mythology, the phoenix bird doesn't fly off a golden perch. It flies out of ashes, its own death. And, um, you know, when you go to Buddhism and you have that the self must die in order that the self be born and so forth. You must lose your life in order to gain it from Christianity. So no matter where you go, that process is part of it. That's right. And we are with Gloria Karpinski, author, speaker, teacher, and healer. You can reach her at www.gloriakarpinski.com. She will be appearing in Charleston at the Sophia Institute. Uh, September 11th through 13th, and she will also be at the Belief Center in Lexington, South Carolina, doing a weekend workshop on mystical Christianity. Come back in just a few minutes, and we're going to speak a little bit more about form, surrender, and conscious change. Awakened Media for a Transforming World, Seventh Wave Network. Just what is Skills USA? Skills USA specifically prepares you for the workforce. Skills USA empowers students to connect with a network of people. Skills USA allows students to connect with business and industry, to manage their education, and to really get a feel of the real world. Skills USA 
Find out more on the web at skillsusa.org. Experience higher love, an archangelic journey into ascended joy and authentic living. Your hosts, Sri Ram Ka and Kira Ra, will assist you to open your heart, expand your love, and be ever-present with true joy. Your journey with Sri and Kira begins right here on the 7th Wave Network with Higher Love, Wednesdays at 5 p.m. Pacific, 8 p.m. Eastern. Have you seen 1111? Do you wonder why certain numbers keep showing up in your life? 11, 111, 22, 33, 444. People all over the world are seeing 1111 and learning the language of universal communication. Subscribe to 1111 Magazine today. www.1111mag.com 1111 Magazine is a bi-monthly print publication that offers a rich, multi-sensory experience. As you engage with experts and topics of consciousness, become enlightened, empowered, and energized so you live a passionate and authentic life of conscious choices. 1111 Magazine, a daily staple for lifting the mindset, discovering the heart, and stepping into conscious living. 1111 Magazine. Order now at www.1111mag.com. 1111mag.com. Listening on a higher dimension. Seventh Wave Network. You are listening to 1111 Talk Radio. If you'd like to join today's discussion, please call in toll free at 1 866 472 5795. Again, 1 866 472 5795. You may also send an email to info at believesc.com. Now back to 1111 Talk Radio with Simran Singh. We have been spending a wonderful hour with Gloria Karpinski. Uh, you can find out more about her at gloriakarpinski.com and also be introduced to wonderful books such as Where Two Worlds Touch and Barefoot on Holy Ground. There are also several CDs, meditation CDs, uh, such as Meeting the Committee, and also a new audio book on Where Two Worlds Touch that is absolutely wonderful. One other topic I'd like to get into, since we only have one segment left, Gloria, is your uh, use of the word disciple, because I found that very, very powerful. And I know that just in doing 1111 magazines, so often people try to follow a guru, they try to find a teacher, and many times people forget that that teacher, it's very good to have teachers out there, but that there's also a teacher within. How do you define that word disciple, and, and, and go into a little bit about how you write about that? Well, that's interesting that, that you would uh, pick that out to, to, to talk about, because uh, when I was writing uh, Barefoot on Holy Ground, Oh, the subtitle on that is 12 Lessons in Spiritual Craftsmanship. And um, so the whole uh, point of that book was to, um, to offer some ideas and some of, uh, some of the experience I've had working with people and the privilege I've had of, of interacting with so many people that are committed as to things that seem to me that work are that are, are all for people's consideration. In fact, throughout the whole book, I'm... I'm frequently referring to consideration because rather than dictation or, you know, this is a rule or anything like that. So when I was thinking, okay, what do we call these people? Because, you know, they're, they're all over the map. They might be doctors, lawyers, and candlestick makers. I mean, they can be anything as far as the role they're fulfilling in the world. But what is the common denominator? And, and what I found is the common denominator, no matter what word I came up with, ended up with disciple. And, and so I mean it in the context of a disciple of one's inner truth. And, and, you know, we get the word discipline from that, which sounds like a harsh word, and I think sometimes we have to embrace these kind of words. It's, it's not harsh, but what it means is that instead of identifying with my money, my profession, my age, my marital status, or any of the outer things, all of which can change and all of which are going to change in one form or another, it's identifying with that unchanging, everlasting spirit 
uh, because we are eternal beings. Uh, we are beings made in light, uh, of light. And so when we say, that is what I wish to have as my identity, then as Mother Mira, who is a very in, in, enlightened being on our planet, said once, when you know you're eternal, you can play your true role in time and space. And I, I love that quote because I think it's true. And then when you're playing your role in time and space, uh, you are living that spirit uh, through whatever you're doing, being a good mother, or, you know, teaching the third grade, um, you know, going to the grocery store. Um, and, and so it is that process of aligning mind, body, spirit to the deepest intentionality, and that to me is a discipleship. I, I think that's beautiful. One point that you brought up was the definition of disciplined or disciple, and I find that we sometimes are t- taught or or perceive words to mean one thing when they actually do mean something else. And yeah. I know I know there are a lot of discussions I've had with people where I've suggested, you know, maybe create your own dictionary now of what these words mean for you because oh, we can paralyze ourselves sometimes by by staying in the constrictedness of what someone else has told us a word signifies. I, I think that's probably true. So it's part of the whole thing of examining, taking everything in, and examining it, and um, being willing to to um, to be t- to be teachable. That's for starters. You know, that uh, to say I don't know that is a mark, actually, of a step toward wisdom. I think is being able to say I don't know. I heard the Dalai Lama do that one time in a lecture in California, and I loved it. Right in the middle, uh, right after giving a very erudite lecture. When people start asking questions, he would often shake his head and say, I don't know. You know? Mm-hmm. Yes. <laughs> it was such a demonstration of, um, of, of, of real humility. It's like to claim what we know and be willing to say, I don't know, and to sort of uh, let ourselves stand on that uh, very delicate balancing act between pushing edges and staying poised with what we do know, being open-minded and not gullible, you know? And you also write that disciples, you have certain points that you've written, uh, disciples are, are ident- identified by their being and not their doing, or they tend to yeah. be individuals that, that discipline themselves enough to call forth the positive and the good in every circumstance. Mm-hmm. So this is really someone consciously choosing a path to grow. Oh, I think that's it. Absolutely. You, you, I mean, you said it in the word, it's to consciously choose. You know, not to have chosen for you, but to consciously choose, you know. Um, so many think that they are being conscious, but how does how can one truly discern how conscious they are? Well, I don't think that I can answer that in 25 words or less, but I would certainly say that there are criteria to use, and I think this is a good starting point for anybody at a certain point is to stop and say, what is my criteria for being conscious? I think that, um, you know, I have my own standard is can I bring love to any situation? Can I release something? Am I being reactive to something? Do I need to judge anything? One time I had a spirit guidance that said, any time you need to judge, you can be sure that something is off in your own, in your own pattern, in your own, you know. The way the quote came in was, um, do you object to the design of a bird's wing? Do you object to the orbit of the planet? If you feel the need to object to the pattern of another person's soul, you can be sure something is out of harmony with your own. Mm. And and I have found this to be true. That's part of my criteria. Is if I feel the need to judge, then I, I need to say, wait a minute, you're not very conscious about this. You know, some button's been pushed or um, a prejudice has been enacted or something. Well, what that part of that is me? Mm-hmm. Yes, Definitely. And what role does forgiveness play in all this? You brought about the the role of love and using that as a tincture for fear. Where does forgiveness fall in all of this? I I think forgiveness is love. I think think that there are very few rules that I've seen (laughs) that I would say in all traditions. um, You know, there's a handful of things I can say that I really believe they are there in all teachings, and one of them is forgiveness. Is that what we don't forgive... Uh, we take to bed with us every night. And um, I think that any event or situation 
that has been very painful to us, we we have to use that like grist for our mill. Do you know what I mean? We use it to process. Okay, this is what's going on. This is what's hurt in me. This is what got damaged in me. This is what set me on a certain one of those roads before I could get to my main highway. I went on this detour, and, it, and this event or this person or this situation took me there. Okay, and so we have to spend our time and energy and um, and tools, our psycho-spiritual tools, to find out, to use it for everything that we can, to find out everything we can about ourselves. And then at some point, at some point we have to say, and now I'm through with it, and I'm going to release it. And that is forgiveness. And that is the wisdom of Gloria Kartinsky. You can find her at GloriaKartinsky.com. I urge you to get her books, Where Two Worlds Touch and Barefoot on Holy Ground. They have been instrumental and sit by my bedside all of the time. So look her up and find out more about what she's doing. My guest next week is going to be Chandra, Rose of Light, and we're going to be speaking about the Divine Feminine and the Miscreations. I look forward to speaking to you next week on 1111 Talk Radio. Thank you for stepping into the doorway of conscious choice with 1111 Talk Radio. Please join host Simran Singh again next Thursday at 4 p.m. Pacific Time, 7 p.m. Eastern Time for another enlightening edition here on the Seventh Wave Network. Remember, shift happens. Thanks again for listening to the preceding program brought to you on the 7th Wave Network. For more information about our network and to check out additional show hosts and topics of interest, please visit 7thWaveNetwork.com. The Voice America Talk Radio Network is the worldwide leader in live Internet talk radio. Visit VoiceAmerica.com. The views and ideas expressed on the preceding program are strictly those of the host or guests and do not necessarily reflect the views and ideas held by the Voice America Talk Radio Network, its staff, and management. 